Hi all, I have another wonderful game of Mikhail Tal to show you today. This game is in the 1958 prestigious USSR Championship round 12. It was against Yefim Geller. I'll just play the pronunciation on chess games, Tom. Yefim Geller. Yefim Geller. Yefim Geller. Okay, so who was Geller? He was born in Ukraine. He learned to play chess as a young man, arrived on the international scene quickly by qualifying as a world championship candidate in 1952, thereby earning the grandmaster title. During Geller's career, he appeared in the candidates five more times and completed in a record 23 Soviet chess championships, winning two in 1955 and 1979. His aggressive playing style and expertise in double-edged positions culminated in positive scores against four world champions over the course of his career, both Nick Smith, Lord Petrosian and Fischer. He also scored victories against Irva, Boris Spassky, Mikhail Talent and Tony Karpov, bringing his total of world champions beaten to eight, a record he shares only with Botvinnik, Petrosian and Korshnoy. He won the 1992 World Senior Championship, so a very prestigious player actually, Yefim Geller. Uh, let's have a look at this game. It was a Roy Lopez actually, it went into a Roy Lopez and there's a very funny pun for this game at Chess Gamescom. No one expects the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> so Spanish as in Roy Lopez, Spanish priest. So Roy Lopez, okay, rookie one, b5, bishop b3. Pretty standard stuff so far, standard Roy Lopez territory. So an iconic <laughs> position actually in opening theory. These moves have been played so many times. Up to here. <laughs> now, the usual move is white to play d5. That's kind of the bulk standard move. So for example, d5 and a very typical game would be like this. Where white's maneuvering potentially knight to g3 but it was squashed there with knight h5 this this is kind of typical very closed that's a typical sequence getting a bit further than needed maybe that's that's a typical idea to close the position now okay but here Mikhail Tal played b4 this objectively might not be the best move but it might suit Tal's style if it creates great complications c takes c takes so a knight is entrenched on c4 it seems for free why it's basically encouraged that well it's also encouraging his b4 pawn to be a subject of attention here it's looking pretty vulnerable so there are two rather strange curiosities here what what's going on why would tell have this seemingly weak pawn on b4 here he plays knight bd2 challenging the knight and yeah black is at a crossroads here black decides to liberate both bishops actually by playing d5 you can see that there's pressure on b4 there's more pressure on the center look at the central tension it's huge after d5 another alternative would have been to take on d2 but then white's protecting that pawn but still d5 this position if white's having to defend like this, I mean, it seems perfectly okay for black. But anyway, d5. We have e takes d5. e takes d4. Knight takes c4. b takes. Queen takes d4. And black takes on b4 expecting the rook to move and if the rook moved I mean look at d5 it's very weak here okay so does the rook need to move that's the big question I mean this is all caused by Tal's b4 right that b4 pawn was weak and now it's been hit it's been taken and even the rook which is kind of connected on that angle now is attacked so what does Tal play here 
if I give you five seconds, what would you play here with white? Okay, Tal didn't move the rook. He played rook b1. Exchange sack time. Now, if he played rook d1, bishop takes d5, for example, this position has actually has its own venom. If white gets a chance for bishop g5, then it's dangerous on h7. But black in this position can play bishop c3. And here, this is actually just leading to equality. This is a line paired on it. Just white can force a draw if he can just rip apart black's king in this line. Yeah. Um, also, instead of bishop takes a1 in this line, if g takes again, white's just getting a perpetual check. Just carries on getting a perpetual check. So, okay, I mean, rook d1 is not entirely, the point is rook d1 is not losing, but it's not that much, should we say, entertainment value. But rook b1 is, <laughs> it's an exchange sack. Okay, so black actually took on e1 here. We have rook takes b7. And there are certain danger points here. If we just look at this position, for a moment. White's gaining an extra tempo. This bishop has to leave, otherwise it's going to be taken. The rook's on the seventh, looking at vulnerable f7. The two bishops are pointing at black's king. The queen's nicely centralized. Can maybe even switch to h4 if needed. So yeah, there's, there's pressure on points in black's position. f7, f6, h7 here. Clear pressure. And Okay, black played rook e8 here, which seems fairly logical. It protects the bishop. The bishop doesn't have to move. Apparently, maybe technically best is bishop a5, with the curious idea of getting the bishop round to help defend f6. For example, like this. This position, there's bishop d8. And black might end up being a tiny bit better. For example, this position, black might be a tiny bit better. Okay, so bishop a5 wasn't played. Instead, black you know, defends this bishop in this in this position with rook e8. d6. d6 is interesting in two ways. The escape route is cut off potentially from the black king wandering to e7. But also it's kind of opened up this diagonal. It's free to d5 square and the diagonal in general, which means now queen takes c4 is more dangerous for queen takes f7 to join forces with the rook. So it's it's a nice move, d6. Black played here queen c8 hitting the rook. It's a tricky position. Uh, if the bishop goes back, you know, queen takes c4 as mentioned. And, you know, this is getting to be quite nice for white, this position here, the exchange down, but so much pressure. Dangerous pawn here, f7 looking vulnerable. This position would end up being great for white. You can see that f7 could be an issue in this, in this variation. White can end up being better, getting the exchange back. So it's very, very dangerous. This is a good move in circumstance, queen c8. Okay, so the rooks attacked. Mikhail Tal to play. Let me ask you, what do you think Mikhail Tal played in the position? If I give you five seconds to pause the video, starting from now. Okay, he didn't actually move the rook, shockingly. He played actually bishop g5. Yeah, incredible stuff. <laughs> bishop g5. Just leaving the rook hanging. You might wonder what on earth is this, of course. Why didn't the rook just move to c7? Isn't that just saying to just move the rook to c7? Yeah, queen e6. This, this position here. Why well, it's actually, again, 
the exchange down, but better, this pawn guarantees a great possession. So, um, okay. So bishop g5 is is an alternative. Yeah, rook, rook c7 was fine as well. It was actually may, maybe even the best move. But this is very interesting as well. Okay, so we have here rook e2. Uh, the point is, okay, why didn't black take the rook here? If queen takes b7, we have bishop takes f6, and this creates a world of pain for black's king safety. As you know, before I mentioned this, this d6 pawn is cutting off the king from e7. So it turns out here, check and queen f5. Is very dangerous here. It's uh, absolutely <clears throat> and completely winning. Look at the role of this pawn. The king's got no escape. You know, king here. We're going to just make because of that pawn on d6. Amusingly, so yeah, it's a uh, very very dangerous position. So that that rook, you know, it wasn't taken. We have rook e2. Rook c7 now, queen e6. Now white takes on e1, rook takes check. Rook d8. Then this position, top played bishop takes f6. And his position is actually not that bad. Black here. Arguably didn't well no not arguing that she didn't play the best move. Now why didn't he play the best move? What is the best move? In fact, the best move would seem to be taking with the queen at the two choices 50-50. But it seems Geller might have rejected this continuation here because although he's the exchange up again, it's difficult to win this. This is equal this is an equal position so he rejected this sort of position he's not going to do anything about that pawn he's not got a pass pawn potential in fact white's got a potential h pawn here it's in balance this position even though white's um the exchange down but anyway in the game actually g takes f6 was played And can you see what Tal played in this position? If I give you five seconds to pause the video here. Okay. Rook e7. Yeah, it's skewering the queen and rook. The game continuation here was uh, queen takes d6, taking taking, and white's a bishop up. Before we get into that, I mean, white's a bishop up there, it's not that great. But if you might want to try and exploit the pin, so let's say queen takes e7. Instead, there's a check here. And then we can take the queen, so that's no good. If we play rook takes d6, we just take on e6, basically. And then we're a bishop up again. Yeah, <laughs> it's not it's not great. Also, by the way, on this this position, the position is so strong, white doesn't even need to go bishop up. White can actually play an even stronger move. Queen h4. And funny enough, if queen takes e7, black's king is again stopped from using e7 and gets mated. You know, th this line again is unfortunate. But so this this is actually crushing this position with queen h4 here. The rook is stopping any check. If rook d4, you know, we mate. Or no, pardon me, not in this line, we don't mate. We, we take 
we could take the queen and it's kind of going to be over soon it's once just just winning in there so yeah rookie seven's pretty unfortunate whatever way you cut and slice this whatever way this is cut this is oh dear blacks in the game continuation black ends up yeah bishop down Tal doesn't mind giving up a2 he's pretty confident he can win this even giving up a2 here actually I mean just basically it's not it's not very pleasant uh, f7 is vulnerable white's a bishop up this pawn's not really going to go anywhere it's a slow torturous death so black actually uh resigns here very very interesting clash Tal bringing out these positions with great complexity and problems to solve for the opponents and even Yafim Geller a, a really renowned player just couldn't handle it he cracked rather dramatically though yeah he, he avoided the draw because he thought during the game he was, he was a bit better and in doing so he thought he was winning but actually he was losing so yeah on 50 50 yeah that was a spectacular blunder at the end with with that logic that okay this is drawn therefore I've got to try this other thing but actually that was losing okay I hope you enjoyed this comments questions likes all appreciated thanks very much